This is called my six minute miracle. Um, my story starts out in Denver, Colorado. I was a typical kid with no worries, no cares, and no problems really. I would go to school and the only thought I had was to get good grades and what was for lunch. <laughs> I have an older sister and a younger brother and a mother that loves God with all of her heart. But I had a father that made our house a prison most of the time. Years of hearing my father blame everything wrong in his life on the people he loved the most really hurt. As time went on, he would cheat on my mother and beat her, and then he would come back and beat us. Countless times I have been kicked down the stairs, punched, excuse me, punched in the face, dragged from my head and down the stairs. I woke up in the middle of the night to clean up the puke off the floor. I had hot thrown spaghetti on me because I didn't know he didn't like onions. I was kicked in the back of the head. So hard that I had vertigo for four months. And the last and final thing he did was he put a knife in my leg and my left thigh. Um, with living in a house of abuse, I, I looked for any way to leave my prison. I called a home. That's when I discovered, that's when I discovered it might be better to try some, some safety in other people. And also, I found comfort in drugs, false comfort. Psalm 69.3 says, I'm very weary with my crying out. I'm weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. At the age of 12, I was married by three unknown men. And in that rape, it resulted in a pregnancy that led to an abortion. That was the start to me thinking that God had left me to deal with my things on my own. I figured, how could, I, how could God love somebody that killed his creation? And why would he leave me when I needed him most? Psalm 71 says, please, Lord, come quickly and rescue me. God, show me, my, show me your favor and restore me. At the age of 19, my family I once had was now separated the night I was stabbed by my dad. That led me on a path to destruction looking for love from a man in the same way I was shown by my earthly father. Not knowing that it was wrong in so many ways, going from one abusive relationship to another. At the age of 22, I gave birth to a beautiful baby girl that I named Serena. I thought that maybe if I had a kid, it would stop me from doing drugs, but she was not enough for me to stop her. She was taken from me at the age of four. I also suffered the loss of what would have been my third child at seven months of pregnancy, and I dove deeper into drugs. By the time I reached the age of 26, I, the one thing that meant the most, the, meant the most to be taken from me by my father, and drove to Texas to live. Romans 70, 20 says, if my behavior contradicts my desire to do good, I must conclude that it's not my true identity doing it, but it's an unwelcome intruder of sin, hindering me from being who I really am. Now I've been through some bad relationships, one bad relationship after the next. I finally met a man that will become, that will become my best friend. His name is Steve Montemio. <laughs> We both dove headfirst in the dangerous life of selling drugs at the age of 38. I finally was arrested for intent to distribute, looking at six years in prison, but only by the grace of God, did three years. When I was released, I hit the ground running again, but my drug use became even more frequent. And my best friend decided that he would no longer wanted that kind of a life and got clean for himself. He would continually try to tell me, he would continually try to get me to try a new way of life, but I had such big blinders on that I refused to even consider the words that he would say. James 1.22 says, don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it, for that is the essence of self-deception. Always let his word become like poetry written 
fulfilled by your life. <laughs> I was, I, as I kept up with using drugs, Stevie decided that he would not live that way and he moved to Amarillo, Texas to be with his daughter. But told me that if I, if times got tough that I could move, leave Colorado for good and come live with him. Well then COVID hit and life made that decision for me to move to Texas anyway. I had lost everything in Colorado. So the day I moved down here, I decided, God decided to intervene in my life. I spent my first six days in the Delhart County Jail for getting pulled over and having drugs on me. Thank you. Um, I'm here at Faith City working on completing my probation successfully, but God brought me here. He lifted me out of a pit I never thought I would ever get out of. Eight months ago, my excuse, to live, my excuse to use was a diagnosis of leukemia, but God has freed me from that. <laughs> a wonderful, a wonderful woman named Miss T saw me through the eyes of Jesus <laughs> and thought and helped me to know Jesus in a way that I never thought possible. Jesus has taught me how to love myself again. He has taught me how to show love to others besides our differences. He has also shown me how to love my best friend as a husband. And he has also shown me how to be loved by my real Father in heaven. Amen. Psalms 126 says, It was like a dream. You freed me from the bondage and brought me back home. We laughed and laughed and our and we're overfilled with gladness. We kept shouting for joy and singing to you with praise. Everyone saw it and saying, you have done great miracles for me. You have done a mighty miracle in my life. Please, Lord, do it again. Restore us to our former glory. The streams and refresh us, your refreshing flow over us until my dry heart is drenched again i i who sow my tears and seeds will reap a harvest of full joy of a joyful joy, joyful sorry shout of glee i may weep as i go out to sow my seed but i will return with a joyful laughter and i will shout with gladness as i bring back armloads of blessings and the harvest that overflows and with all of that being said, um, I want to leave you with who I am and who you are in Christ. I'm a child of God, forgiven, justified, sanctified, yes. saved by the grace through faith and redeemed from the hand of the enemy. <laughs> Delivered from the powers of darkness and daily overcoming the devil. Not moved by what I see and casting all, casting down all vain imaginations. Free from all bondage and being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Led by the Spirit and casting all my cares on Jesus. Doing all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he kept me safe wherever I go. Ex ex exercising my authority over the enemy and bringing every thought into captivity. Continually praising the Lord with my mouth. Plus coming in and going out. Healed by his stripes, being an Im imitator of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. If you have never felt freedom, I urge you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior because freedom feels amazing. Yes.
And when I was 13 years old, I found out she had HIV. I, and, and I was, uh, I was mad at God. Let's go. You got to. I asked him why. This whole wide world. Did my mom have to get sick? At 17 years old, she died when I was she died when I was 17. And then I, I started doing all kinds of drugs like PCP, but my life was still manageable. And then I met meth, and my life turned upside down. I went, I went to two, two mission programs in Fresno, California. I, I, can, I, I completed them, graduated both 18 month programs. They were 18 months long. I just couldn't stop, I, couldn't, I just couldn't stay clean. I knew I had, I, I knew God had a plan for me to tell, tell as many people about the love of Jesus. I have, a, I have a scripture that I really like um, that I want to read to you guys. Uh, it's um, 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in, is not in him. For everything that is in the world, the craving of the sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not, not from the Father, but of the world. And the world and its desires are passing away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. I, ch I, I challenge each and every one of you guys this morning to, to, to die to your flesh or die in your flesh. And I, I, I challenge you, I got one more challenge for you guys to be fat this morning. <laughs> What's bad? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's uh, faith, and that's the things of God. It's faithful, available, and teachable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the word no just wasn't really in my vocabulary. When I was five years old, I was molested because I was afraid to say no and run to my mom. At eight years old, some friends wanted me to try marijuana and alcohol because I wanted to fit in. I didn't say no. When I was 14, I had an older boyfriend whom I gave my virginity to because I thought by doing so, he would like me more. My longing for acceptance got me taken advantage of by more men than I'd like to admit. At 15 was when meth was first was first introduced to me. The guy who had it, he was a familiar face. He had graduated from that same high school I went to. He was very persistent on getting me to try it and because I didn't want to be that girl, I gave in. When I was 19, I thought I was hot stuff because I was dating a drug dealer. He was very abusive, but I was his ride or die, so I didn't care. Spiritually, I was already dead and physical death is where I was headed. At the time, though, I didn't see it like that. All I knew was that I finally had someone who wanted me. By the time I was 20, I was single, selling drugs, and had my own place. With that comes people who want you for what you have, which led me into a three and a half year long toxic relationship. I just wanted someone forever with me and for me, so I accepted him and his trash. Romans 6.21 says, So tell me, what benefit ensued from doing those things that you are now ashamed of? It left you with nothing but a legacy of shame and death. Romans 12.2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Mm -hmm. Tired of all the crap in my life, I cried out to God with all my heart. 
I told him the truth on what I was feeling and dealing with. I asked him for forgiveness and asked him to help me not only get out of the situation I was in, but to help me with life in general. He heard my prayers. I started doing so much better. I had finally left the relationship. I was, wor I was working. I was doing better with my kids, and mentally and emotionally, I felt a lot better. I cut back on the drugs, but I hadn't given them up completely. I always prayed, though, that one day God would just take that addiction away. Well, he took it, but not in the way I wanted him to. <laughs> um, some time goes by, and because I still wasn't doing my part on things, I ended up in jail. Once again, here I was calling out to God. I asked him to make a way for me to get out of jail, be a better mom, and to stay sober. That's when I was offered a deal to complete a program. I put in an application to Faith City Mission and a 12-step program in Oklahoma City. 12-step was only a six-month program. I wanted to go the faster route and just do the six months, but before making my decision, I prayed and asked God where he wanted me to go. And of course, he said Faith City. I was like, really God, a whole year? I was scared and I really did not want to give a whole year of my life, but I obeyed. Yes, the 12th step was shorter and would have helped me with the addiction, but God knew I needed help with things deeper than the addiction. Like why I was so scared of rejection and why even if I knew that what those around me were doing was wrong, I chose to do them anyway. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through 18 says, Therefore, come out from among of unbelievers and separate yourselves from, from them, says the Lord. Amen. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I've been at Faith City for eight months now, knowing more about who my father is than ever before, and he has shown me who I am. I'm his blood-bought daughter. I no longer have to follow the crowd to feel accepted. He accepts me just the way I am, flaws and all. People come and go, but Christ is eternity. Ephesians 1, 6 says, So we praise God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. And Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the, in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in, in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his, gra his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Amen. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. By God's grace, I have been saved. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
all of a sudden I fit in, I got along great with everybody, I was a lot of the party, and I was excited and angry at the same time, because my parents had been telling me my whole life alcohol was bad, and that was obvious a lot. <coughs> alcohol just made everything so much better. And so I really grabbed onto that and started drinking all the time, started basically ignoring anything and everything my parents had told me because I didn't trust them anymore. Uh, started doing drugs, started hanging out with all the troublemakers and stuff like that. Really grasped onto that identity. I decided, well, if I can't get along with these people that do good, I can't behave well, I can't, I'm really good at being bad. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to hold on to this real tight. And gradually got in with the worst and worst crowd. Uh, I thought I'd found freedom because I could do whatever I wanted. Nobody could tell me what to do. I did what I wanted, when I wanted. And nobody could stop me. Uh, then I started getting in with some really dangerous people. Uh, and started becoming somebody that I didn't really want to be, but I had to be. Because once I realized I didn't want to be in with this crowd, it was too late. I was too far in, and there wasn't no getting out. So <coughs> that's what I thought. And so I just kind of transformed into this other person. And um, eventually in my later teens, I ended up getting a girl pregnant. My daughter came along. And that kind of pulled me out of it for a minute. Uh, I straightened up. Not completely. I mean, I was still drinking. I was still doing things. But I was functioning. I was working. I had a house. I was doing everything I needed to do. I had custody of my daughter. Everything was going great. I thought I had everything I ever wanted. And then one weekend she was gone at her mom's and I got a little too intoxicated and I ended up getting arrested. And based on that day, they decided I was a danger to my daughter and I couldn't be trusted with her so they took her away from me. And That tore my whole world apart, and I spiraled hard. And rather than straightening up and doing what I needed to do to get her back, I dove headfirst into that lifestyle I thought I'd gotten out of, and got 12 times worse than I'd ever been before. Tore my whole life apart. I lost my house and my job and my wife, my daughter. I went. I don't even know how long longer than I want to admit without even seeing her. I was just not showing up to the visitations because I was so far gone I didn't want her to see it. And uh, spent the majority of my time in jail or rehabs or other court ordered programs that they make me do. And eventually going to prison changed my mind. I decided I, wanted, I didn't want to do this anymore. This isn't the life I wanted to live. And so I started trying to like really turn my life around, stop doing the drugs, stop drinking. But that identity crisis was still there. Even though I wasn't doing drugs, I was being a criminal. When I looked in the mirror, that's all I saw. All I saw was what I'd done, not who I was. And it made it impossible for me to change. Uh, Alone, anyway. I was, I really don't know. I don't know if I believed in God or not. I wanted to. I was raised in church. I wanted to believe in God, but I just, I don't know. I couldn't understand why this God that everybody told me was so good and so loving and so kind would let me end up where I was and let me go through all the crap that I went through. And it just didn't make any sense to me. And if there was a God, he must just not care about me. I must have already done too much. I was irredeemable. There was no coming back from what I've done. And it got real bleak there. I was, it seemed like I was trying everything I could possibly think of to make things better, to turn my life around, to do what I needed to do. Obviously, without God, I wasn't trying to do that. 
I was just trying to do, do it my way. And I got to the point, I'd lost all hope. I didn't think I was ever going to be able to change. It seemed no matter how hard I tried or what I tried or no matter how good my intentions were, I ended up in the same spot every time with nothing, with no hope, with just bleak misery, loneliness, isolated off the middle of nowhere somewhere. And I didn't want to do that anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I mean, I knew I didn't want to go back to drugs because I was miserable that way, but I was off drugs and was still miserable. I still couldn't get anything together. And I was going to church here and there with my parents. Um, <coughs> Still not really sure what I believed or if I believed. <coughs> and I was sitting in church one day. The preacher was up there talking, but I wasn't really listening. I was kind of flipping through the Bible, just waiting for it to be over so I could go home. And I read Matthew chapter 6, where towards the end he was talking about not to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. I'm paraphrasing. But... He said, don't worry about any of this. God will take care of that. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I remember reading it and thinking, well, that's crap. That's never been true in my entire life. I'd never seeked God or his righteousness, but in my mind, I was thinking, that's a holy crap. That's never been true. And... A couple weeks later, I'd gotten in a real bad spot mentally. I was really unstable. I was having meltdowns just randomly and had had all I could take and I was ready to just end it all. I had a plan, I had it ready, I was fixing to do it. I was done. And then my phone rang all of a sudden. And it was an evangelist with our church who had been trying to better part of four or five years to pull me out of the mud and I wouldn't let him do it. And he called me and told me about this program and said, he didn't really tell me a lot about it. He just mentioned there was a place in Amarillo he knew about. It's done good for other people in our church. And he thought if I went there and gave it an honest effort, it would be exactly what I needed. And at that point, I tried everything else. Uh, I didn't know where else to turn, and I felt like maybe, just maybe, this was God trying to tell me. Yes. And so I decided to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And I got here, and it didn't, like, everything wasn't hunky-dory right away. Obviously, the first little bit was rough. I remember... I got here and it was a little bit better because I wasn't so isolated and everything. But I was still just, it didn't take, seem like my mental state was getting any better. I still didn't think anything of myself. And one day I was laying there in the overnight dorm just laying there thinking and something told me, like, just, I thought you were going to come here and try to start seeking me. How come you're not? You're just sitting around doing nothing. And I was like, okay, I'll give that a shot. So I got a Bible. I didn't have one, but I went and found one. There's lots of them laying around up there. I <laughs> <laughs> started, started reading it. And as I was reading it, I started realizing I had lots of misconceptions. So like I said, I grew up in church, but I had all these ideas in my head that was just rules and regulations, and you have to do this and this and this, or you're going straight to hell, and it's like, I don't know, I never liked rules, I never liked authorities, but I never liked that. And the more I got to reading it, that's not what it was. I was reading in it, and all I kept reading was, once I turn my life over to Christ, I'm a new creation. I'm redeemed. He doesn't even remember any of that old stuff. My sins are separated as far as the East is from the West. I had a lot of Bible verses written down. I couldn't narrow them down. But uh, I'll read a couple for you. These are one of my favorites. 
2 Corinthians 5 and 17. We put it in the slideshows at the graduations a lot, and I love this verse. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And it wasn't immediately, but eventually through <coughs> staying in the Word and going to the classes we have here, Michael Miles and Cody are both real big on identity. And I really grabbed a hold of that. It, I learned the more that I was able to truly believe that and start standing on it, <coughs> it got easier to become the person that I was supposed to be all along. And I'm by no means perfect, but I think about that guy that walked in here and I barely recognize him. Yes. <laughs> I still struggle every day. I still let my anger get the best of me here and there. But it's, I feel joy and I feel peace in my heart that I've never felt in my entire life. I'm happy with who I am. Um, I know who I am now. I don't, I don't have to put on a mask or a facade to be who I think I need to be. I just know who I am and I'm able to walk in that. It was this program, the classes we take here, and getting into the Word myself, and being able to see it with my own eyes, who God says I am, that has changed my entire life. But that's what I got. comments and I, I was reminded there's kind of a common theme that kind of ran through all of that that uh, people either trying to go it alone or with the wrong team and, uh, and it kind of got me thinking about draft horses uh, you know <laughs> and, uh, well and there's a reason you know Jesus said you know take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy my burden is light and uh, you know that yoke is uh, that beam that crosses the shoulders of, of a pulling team and your average draft horse if, my, if I remember correctly can pull about 8,000 pounds but you put two of them together you'd think they could pull 16,000 but it's not true it's about 24,000 it's about one and a half times when you when you yoke two together if you know two good horses that are both pulling together with a common goal, it's a it's a force multiplier. Man. And uh, when we yoke up with the right people, he also said, "Don't be unevenly yoked." Because when you got one that's that he's slacking back and he's letting those tracers hit him in the back of the legs, it drags the other one down, and now he can't even pull that eight thousand. And so when we work together and we're yoked together with the Lord and with with people with a common purpose we are able to, we're, we're a force multiplier. We're able to spread the words of the kingdom and we're able to be encouraged by each other. But when we're in the, out in the world and we're yoked with somebody that ain't pulling in the same direction, it drags us down too. Yes. And uh, anyway, I want everybody to be encouraged by what we've heard here because uh, this place does great things for people and uh, I'm glad everybody's here. But if you would bow with me, we'll go ahead and say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you again today thanking you for all the many blessings you've given to us. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for your Son and his perfect life as an example to us and his death on the cross for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for these students to come together and to, to focus on you and to bring their life their lives to, to you and to, to come into, in accordance with each other and to, to be able to pull together for you. We ask that you help us all as we depart this place and to go out into the world and to let your light shine to the world so we can bring glory to you and let your light shine to the others so we may further the kingdom. We ask that you be with us in all things and forgive us our sins and help us to, to live lives as you would have us to do. And we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.